Hey, what's up? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching Sit Down. Pleasure to be joined today by Alexandra Carter. Brand new book, Ask for More. Books right there in the background. How are you? I'm doing well today. How are you? I'm great. I'm really excited to talk to you. You've had this really interesting career and I think a book that's going to help a lot of different people. So how did this whole thing come together? Why don't we just wind back and start at the beginning here? Yeah, for sure. So I teach at Columbia Law School and I teach a subject called mediation, which is basically the art of helping people negotiate better so that they can get out of conflict and make deals. You know, and having helped now thousands of people in that way, I realized that by the time I got to people, you know, their business partnerships or their personal relationships were pretty far gone. They were already in court. And I really wanted to find a way that I could give people tools to negotiate better before they got to that point when they could use them to really like achieve their personal goals and also create much better deals for themselves. So what are some common issues that whether it's your students or people at the UN you work with, like what do people struggle with the most? Because I can make the argument, it's like we don't value ourselves enough. We have issues with confrontation, like what pops up the most when you're working with different people? Yeah, for sure. I think not valuing yourself enough is one of them. But but part of it is also that I see a lot of people having what I call a negotiation one car accident, you know, where they get sort of tangled up in their own brain, you know, and they have trouble, you know, standing on their uh, priorities or even making priorities or knowing what to say in the moment. They get in and they kind of go blank. And that's because they haven't known the right way to prepare or the questions to ask themselves so that they can be clear and confident when they go into any situation. Well, it seems like preparation is a huge part of it. So when did you realize that you were uniquely gifted to help people out with all these different situations? You know, I realized it when I failed to prepare myself. <laughs> um, I think, you know, and in fact, I think one of the things that led me to write Ask for More was my first salary negotiation. Mm. And it wasn't until my 30s that I actually had to negotiate for myself. And I went in with my power suit and I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this. And they came in above. And so I kept my face neutral and I said, thank you so much. I'm gonna run the numbers and I'll be back to you. I didn't know what to do. So I called a senior woman in the field and I said, can I ask for some advice? They came in above, so what should I do? Should I just take the offer? And she goes, I'm gonna tell you what to do, Alex you're going to go in and you're going to ask for more. And I said, I'm going to ask for more. And she said, yes, because when you teach someone how to value you, you teach him how to value all of us. So if you're not going to do it for yourself, I want you to do it for the woman or for the person who's coming up behind you. And that was the moment that I realized, maybe not so much that I had a gift, but that I had a responsibility. I was great at helping other people, I was a little bit less great at advocating for myself. And so that's the story of how I decided to stand up, claim my expertise, write a negotiation book, and teach other nice folks how to advocate for themselves too. That's a really awesome experience and I'm, I'm really happy that you share that and just have that in the book. What are some other lessons people can gain from this and really some specific, specific, specific things you wanna hone in on here? Yeah, so the first thing is to know that you wanna ask questions first. So both of yourself and then of other people. So when you're sitting down with yourself, you know, the first question you really should be asking for every negotiation is, what's the problem I want to solve? May I say, especially during a crisis, I think something happens, right? You know, we lose a client or we get a pay cut and so we immediately start to trying to like toss all the spaghetti at the wall to see what's going to stick. I'm going to reach out to my whole Rolodex. I'm going to start posting a lot on social media. But what's the problem you're trying to solve? Are you just trying to bring dollars in the door during May at any cost? Or are you trying to make targeted pitches to the people who aren't just going to be your client this month? They're going to be your client for the long haul and lead you out of this recession. So starting with thinking strategically about the problem you're solving means that you won't spend all that effort just to figure out you solved the wrong thing. So going off of your story from before, when you go in there and you ask for more and you get pushback, what's the next step to that? If somebody refuses to bend, how should you handle things? Oh, I love that. Okay, first of all, I want people to know that no is not the end of the conversation. 
No does not mean that you have to crawl out of the office on your hands and knees. In fact, no can just be the jumping off point for further discussions. All you have to do when you get a no is ask a question. And the question is, what are your concerns? Or tell me your concerns. That is my magic question for turning a no into a yes. And I can't tell you how often somebody said, nope, we're not gonna do that. And I pick up the phone and I say, tell me your concerns. And they tell me something and I'm able to fix it on the spot and create a yes. When you know the concerns, you know the barrier to the deal, and then you can figure out how to bust that barrier and get to a yes. I think just asking the proper question is a big part of it. And then also just having a dialogue because so much of these confrontations can be so businesslike and we lose communication like this. Like, it feels like you kind of need to take a step back and just be like, hey, we're just talking as two people here, not as like this huge big ordeal that it's really been turned into. Yeah, I think that's right. I think a lot of times, you know, the bad rap that negotiation gets is just fear. You know, we fear that we're going to be taken advantage of. We fear that the other person is going to be an enemy. And here's the thing. You can be a strong advocate for yourself and also be a really friendly, approachable person. It's just a conversation, just the way you could tell me, you know, so here's what I really need, right, to be able to make this work. And I can share, okay, so here are the hangups for me and what I need. And it can just be a conversation where you figure out something that both people are going to feel reasonably good about. So you have your personal experience, you have your professional experience. What surprised you the most when you put this book together? Like what's something that jumped out that you didn't anticipate focusing so much on or something you learned along the way? Something I learned along the way. I learned that putting in the book some of my mistakes turned out to be a really powerful teaching tool. Mm -hmm. And a lot of interviewers have talked to me about the fact that they expected the book to be like me calling down from the top of the mountain, like, hey, the view's great up here, I've made it. Right. And instead it felt like I strapped on a backpack alongside them and I was saying, watch out for that thing I just tripped on. You know, the fact is you don't have to be perfect to be a great negotiator. Sometimes you learn, right, from a situation that didn't go the way you wanted it to, and you take that on board and you do better the next time. So that was something I put in the book that, you know, at the time I thought, oh, is this a good idea to reveal that I'm human after all? And it turns out that humanity uh, is a good thing because it brings more people into the conversation. I mean, those are my favorite types of books. Those are the most universal in terms of the connection. So what are some of the mistakes? Like, give me one right now that you're like, I didn't do this the right way. I wrote about it and I learned about it. Yeah, so um, I was born in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and I'm from New York. And the first time I went to Oklahoma for work, I was a junior professor. And I was used to you know, telling people that I was a law professor and they would look at me like, really, you're a law professor? I was young, I was a woman mm -hmm. and I had a bit of baggage around that. So. I get to Oklahoma and I'm with a friend. We're there for a peacemaking conference. And I get up to the um, rental car desk and the very nice gentleman behind the car asks me what I do. I tell him I'm a law professor and he asks me a four word question. What do you teach? Okay. So for your New York audiences, I heard, what do you teach? I heard <laughs> a comma after the what. And so instead of just answering the question, I said, yeah. I'm a law professor. And the poor guy looks like this. And then my colleague says from behind me, she teaches peace building. And I thought, oh, God, no, right? And I put that in the book because it's so easy to filter what people say through the lens of our own experience and our baggage, right? And so I wrote that to let people know how easy it is to do that and the importance of stepping back to listen. That's a great story. And it's really interesting because I feel like we learn all these things later on in life, but for that next generation, for the younger generation, like, you know, you have a young daughter who's, you know, growing into her own right now. Like what's most important at a young age is you're becoming a teenager and an early adult to think about with all this stuff. Yeah. You know, what's most important I would say is to get to know yourself really well. You know, getting to know myself really well has been, as you said, sort of a lifelong process. But the thing is that when you know, you know, what you're meant to do, 
the deals that you're going to feel best about, you know, your personality in the negotiation room and your priorities as a person. You know, my priorities are going to be different than somebody else's. And so I negotiate not for what other people think I should be or do or achieve. I negotiate for myself and my personal mission on this earth and what's going to make me feel really good when I go to bed every night. And the closer I think that people get to that, the happier and the more successful they will be. Beautifully said. Professor Carter, thanks so much for jumping on and uh, looking forward to having everybody check this one out. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. This was great.